Hello, everybody. Welcome to our last session of the Expo uh, 2022. I hope you had a great two days and many interesting presentations to join. Maybe also join some of our presentations before we are the Nowhere Graph project. And in this last session, we are going to discuss how to build the future knowledge graph infrastructure for the United States. We have a couple of speakers or panelists, so to speak, here, Pascal Hitzler, um, um, Shirley Stevens, Mark Schildhauer, and uh, Tommy Thelen, just in the order that I'm seeing them here on my screen. And we are going to basically essentially have a, have a nice chat that you're welcome to, to listen into. And hopefully this will be interesting to you. And then please either raise your hand or unmute yourself or type something in the chat that we are also going to, to uh, monitor. And then we can make this as interactive as you would like. I know these systems are a little bit odd and difficult to get used to. So um, be patient with us and, and we are going to find a way um, to communicate with you. So maybe before we start diving into some of the interesting questions we want to discuss, I would suggest that each of you very briefly introduces yourself with just, you know, a sentence or two, and we are just going to do this in the order of my Zoom screen. So Pascal, um, you would be first. Pascal Hitzler, uh, Computer Science, Kansas State University. And um, I, I'm mostly known for my work on semantic web, uh, recently focused on ontology modeling. I'm also doing uh, quite a bit on neurosymbolic integration recently, so general artificial intelligence. Super, thank you, Pascal. Shirley, you would be next. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shirley Stephen. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at UCSB. Uh, I uh, work a lot with ontologies, and I'm currently working in the Novagraph project, uh, helping develop uh, ontologies and triplifying data for ingestion in the knowledge graph. Awesome. Thanks, Shirley. And uh, Mark, Mark Schildhauer. Hi, I'm Mark Schildhauer. I'm from the uh, National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Synthesis also called NCs at UC Santa Barbara. I was, um, my background is in ecology, uh, but I've been director of computing until recently semi-retired as my presence here is indicative of. And uh, very interested working with the Data One project and uh, we're very excited as well about how semantics, the semantic approaches we're taking, especially on Nowhere Graph uh, can help integrate uh, lots of environmental data. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Tommy, you are next and last. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Stalen. I also work at NCS. I work as a full stack developer, um, working on uh, various uh, research projects, helping people realize the uh, software that they dream of. Well, fantastic. So maybe we just dive into, into our first questions here and have this an open discussion. So, um, if I if I have a question that matches your interest, then just you know speak up, and that's true for the panelists here. But keep in mind, if you are if you are joining one us as as part of the audience, then you can also jump in at any second or uh, or um, type your questions in the chat. So before we talk about knowledge graph, let's talk about the term that maybe is more familiar to the a little bit less technical audience, and that's fair. And maybe at first you may be thinking how is FAIR and FAIR principles related to knowledge graphs, but the F and the I and the R obviously are about finding and integrating data and making data more reproducible. So let's explore this relation for a second here together. And how do you feel do knowledge graphs folks fit into this FAIR principles picture? I'm not sure who wants to take the, the question um, and I leave it between, the, between you guys too to start talking. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I, coming from NCs, which is a synthesis center, which uh, all of the projects that we sponsor there necessarily bring together a lot of heterogeneous data. You know, synthesis is bringing together a lot of different data. And, and um, so the, the article, you know, that coined FAIR by Mark Wilkinson and Michelle de Montier, really, uh, I think, uh, galvanized the data repository world uh, into, it, it gave them a very catchy acronym, right? Findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And then in that paper, they described, you know, minimally what would be necessary to make all the data being collected by researchers, um, you know, more fair. 
And, you know, sort of covertly, they were indicating essentially the type of semantic approaches that we've been um, pursuing with Nowhere Graph. They did mention XML and RDF. Uh, they were very delicate about it, but my interactions with the data repository world, the environmental data repository world, especially such as at RDA, the Research Data Alliance, or the ESIP Federation, they're all very concerned about making their data more fair. And I think that that Nowhere Graph is really kind of paving the way for uh, for those repositories to better get a grip on how to best make that that vision happen. So I think that, that that FAIR was a wonderful viral acronym and that Nowhere Graph is is right directly in the fast lane on, on making FAIR. We love your answer. Pascal, go next. So, so just to, to add to this, and of course, I completely agree with Mark here. Um, it, it also makes sense to look a little bit kind of at the, at the history, right? I mean, knowledge graphs themselves um, are really an outflow of the work done in the Semendi web field for, for 20 plus years. Um, I, I post a link to a, to a historic overview, which, which kind of explains it a bit if you're not so familiar with that. And uh, at the same time, the, the, uh, the, the FAIR principles, which, which was really kind of, it, as Mark said, it galvanized the field, right? It, it kind of boiled it down to some essentials, uh, which were at the same time uh, formulated generically enough, right? That it, 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 it just makes sense. Um, uh, but again, kind of when they came out and reading that, if you were from within the semantic web field, you were more like, yes, exactly, right? So they just managed to express it better than many people before that. Uh, but that's what the field is about, right? So, so from that perspective, knowledge graphs and all the other semantic web technologies which kind of fuel them um, and FAIR are really tightly intertwined in terms of, well, they, they, they come out of the same things from 20 years ago and are still kind of going lock step in step um, together. Yeah, the set of authors is also overlapping quite a bit, right? Uh, surely, Tommy, do you want to jump in or should we continue with the next question? I was just wondering, since uh, Mark mentioned Nowhere Graph, um, if anyone else, it's not like an answer, but more of like a question to the other Nowhere Graph people uh, in this panel. Uh, since we're talking about FAIR, when we talk about Nowhere Graph, what are the steps that we are taking to make Nowhere Graph FAIR? Mark said uh, Nowhere Graph is, is one of, uh, is, is like primarily goal oriented towards being fair, right? So uh, concretely, what are uh, some of the steps we do to make it fair? Um, and one of the primary things that I think of uh, when it comes to fair is uh, trying to model metadata, rich metadata and provenance information uh, for all the information that we have um, in Nowhere Graph. Uh, if anyone else wants to add anything else. Well, actually, I think, go ahead, go ahead Yano. Well, I was just going to say that we can go right down the FAIR acronym one by one and articulate exactly why Nowhere Graph and the W3C semantic web recommendations essentially enable FAIR. The findability is the dereferenceable HTTP URIs that lead into rich expressive semantics in ontologies. The accessibility is also, again, leveraging the web. So the web is really essential here. The uh, interoperability is the languages like RDF, RDFS, OWL, Shackle, not, not your, you know, your, your, idiosyncratic ER schema, you know, it's expressing the schema in a highly extensible way, in addition, using those W3C recommended languages. And the reusability would come from the opportunity then to, to share some of those vocabularies and ontologies, you know, across the entire internet. So there you have, you know, F-A-I-R right there, completely embodied in our approach with Nowhere Graph. <laughs> 
I absolutely agree, but I think it was important to establish this relation because I think that the fair term, as you just introduced before, Mark, is so widely visible because it's not only an important set of principles, essentially, as we just said, on based on semantic technologies, but it's also nicely boiled down into something, you know, that is all close to our hearts, right? And the, the fair part, of course, in the fair matters greatly. So and actually, that's a nice um, start to another question that I wanted to, to get your feedback on. Namely that obviously if you design such a such a knowledge graph for the future of the you know for the US public and industry, we need to agree on what goes into such a first knowledge graph and what shouldn't. Obviously it can grow and grow. But in your perspectives, are there certain types of, of data that are specifically suited or suitable for knowledge graph integration and maybe other data sets that, that wouldn't fit so well? Mark, go ahead. You know, coming from an environmental synthesis center and having worked with with many dozens of working groups that are struggling to integrate their environmental data, I would say environmental data in particular are highly amenable to uh, being ingested into a knowledge graph. But in addition, like I hate to well, we're the nowhere graph because environmental data always has an important spatio-temporal context. So it's it's extremely useful for incorporating into the graph because you've got that commonality of, of place across all these various environmental data sets. Very well put. Anybody else wants to add to this question? So so perhaps just to just to say um one person's data is another person's metadata and the other way around. So, uh, and, and I think it's important to, to, to kind of acknowledge that there are certain things which just make sense to be put into a knowledge graph and certain things which just don't make sense uh, to be put in a graph structure, right? The, the obvious example I usually give is uh, images, right? I mean, you don't want to encode the pixels as triples. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, likewise, uh, if you have raw data files, um, you know, large collections of sensor data, then it, it needs thinking kind of which parts do you want to put in the knowledge graph to make it fair, right? Um, and which parts you should just kind of link to, you know, as, you know, the, the original CSV sheet, for example, and things yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so this, 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 this is just one thing which, which needs, which needs, uh, uh, which is thinking about generally, is it metadata data? The, the difference is really unclear because it, it, it's, it's very fluent. Uh, but generally, the more things go into metadata, the more they're suitable for knowledge graphs, generally speaking. Um, and then if we think about what you just asked, uh, Christoph, namely to, to build something that is, that is a large kind of US knowledge graph, right, uh, which kind of could be one of the outcomes of this whole track. Uh, in the end or follow up uh, uh, funded work, then um, of course it makes sense to start with with data that is that is of, of common interest uh, of larger interest. Um, but then it's also important to 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 make sure not only kind of what is in there but but that the, the way how it is in the graph also m kind of really lowers the barrier for, all the fair aspects, right? Which means you, you need to be kind of very conscious about what you're doing. Actually, that leads me to, to an, a follow-up question that I hope you guys will find interesting. Pascal, you said data, metadata, then we are talking about knowledge graphs. You mentioned that this comes from the linked data cloud before and so on. We are talking obviously about integration of information and stuff like this. That's quite many terms, right? So what is the difference between data and knowledge in this context why don't we say data graph right but knowledge graph we also say data science and not knowledge science right so what is the what is the knowledge and knowledge graphs what do you guys think well i'll jump in there because uh we uh we learned we when we developed a very nice metadata specification in xml we thought we had really solved the data integration issue, but that was not the case because people were talking about the same thing in different ways. They were talking about different things using the same terms. And so 
even though there was a lot of value in having a formal metadata specification, you can just think about the way somebody's name, for instance, might be referenced. And how do you know, you know exactly who we're talking about until the ORCID identifier scheme really helping a lot with that. So for me, that translation from data to information kind of goes to the data having metadata that describes what the data are about, but the knowledge is further linking to very well-defined notions and relating to other, other aspects, which might, which provide even further additional context and clarification about what you're talking about in, in sort of a, uh, you know, more of an aggregate and higher level of understanding than just the basic, for instance, scientific observation. I, you know, I measured some sea surface temperature on such and such a date at such and such a place. You put it into that broader context. And that's where the semantics comes in. I don't want to call it a discussion, but um, <laughs> so perhaps to, 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 add, to add to that, just a, uh, so, I mean, I think I think the knowledge in knowledge graph is 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 as much a euphemism as intelligence is a is a euphemism in artificial intelligence. But but that just that's just aside, right? Um, but what what is what is meant with that is that well, kind of in artificial intelligence, it's kind of towards intelligence, right? In knowledge graph, it's towards knowledge. Um, uh, but that aside, um, one way of looking at this, and this is completely in, in sync with what Mark said, it's just a kind of different angle, is um, you, you, will, you want to try to make uh, data as self-explanatory as we currently know you can do it. I think this is, this is really key, right? Well, in, in addition to being automatically processable, you know, and all the fair principles, but self-explanatory. And, and the, the way to do that is, as Mark said, through metadata, through expressive metadata and, and other mechanisms. But this self-explanatory is really the key point towards, well, making it more findable, right? Making it more interoperable, uh, et cetera, uh, because you, you're not just kind of getting CSV files thrown at you and you see wind direction south and you wonder it's, if it's to or from, just to give a simple example. <laughs> well, well, fantastic, fantastic answers. And I think that maybe this is maybe not as widely clear. And that's obviously something that we could all work on that this is what's meant by knowledge, right? It's this data plus metadata and not just some metadata where you need the next metadata to understand what the metadata is essentially, but metadata enriched or described in some way that is both machine readable and, and reasonable. And I would I would go a step further than that, Christoph. Um, and, and I don't know if, if everybody agrees on that when I say this, but I think a really, really important aspect here is as well that the, the data organization it's done in such a way that it resonates with 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 the experts on the topic. Uh, I, I I believe that is a that is a, a key aspect of of allowing reusability, uh, and and making it kind of kind of proof for for future and for updates and for reuse in different contexts and merging it with new data and so on. Uh, so it's not only the metadata; it's also the the it really is is the, the the computational artifact which we get or the data artifacts which you produce gra graph plus schema is really between the data and the human conceptual level uh to the extent to which we manage to do this at the moment well it could be even more radical and the way i say it is that that one of the key advantages of semantics and knowledge graph is that they get entirely rid of the data metadata distinction, right, which is a plaque for, for, for many, many years. And surely, Thomas, I, I, I want to make sure that we also hear from you. Do you have ideas to share or thoughts to share on this question? Otherwise, I can just continue to the vocabulary side, which I guess surely is, is, is already waiting for. <laughs> We can move on to vocabularies. Um, okay, okay, we can go to vocabularies. Okay, so obviously we we are we in this nice flow, right? We started with with fair, and then we talked about what goes in and what goes out, and then what the heck is is data versus knowledge and stuff like this. And then Pascal and Mark talked so nicely about the need for self descripting the self description of the data using some sort of of formal semantics. So, what is the role of this formal semantics? What is the role of these ontologies or data or knowledge graph schema in really creating um, a 
widely usable knowledge graph across data sets. Shirley, maybe you go first if you like. Okay. Uh, Mark and Pascal already like really explained it very well. They said, uh, like with respect to our previous question, ontologies are what make data graphs become knowledge graphs, right? Uh, Pascal said ontology plus data is a knowledge graph. And we have these classic definitions of ontologies that say uh, they are formal frameworks for representing knowledge in a domain. Uh, they are used for interoperability. They can enable automated reasoning. But really from a knowledge graphs perspective, I believe ontologies add that extra layer of knowledge and this knowledge helps connect the dots in data. Um, and I'm not sure a data graph as such as a standalone product is can be best used for decision making without this knowledge. And uh, because uh, like again, reiterating they they are the ones that actually provide the semantics to the data. And Pascal mentioned this uh, saying it also adds context to the data. So having this ontology helps us understand what is the use case for this knowledge graph or what is the data uh, that is, it is being used for and uh, who is uh, it for? Like, how how is the data being used? And then you can add additional relationships uh, saying, how can this data be reused with other data? And uh, using an example from our Nowhere Graph, like based on experience, we have all these like hazards and environmental data sets in Nowhere Graph. And in their raw form, uh, they come from all these different sources and they have their own data, uh, data models, but they're all very different. And in not nowhere graph we use ontologies to stitch all this information together to provide a very cohesive view and um, for example we have hurricane katrina uh, which has impacts from one specific data set and trajectories from another data set and uh, the fema data set which tells you about the, uh, the financial assistance or other kinds of relief information that was provided for that specific event but by modeling hurricane as a class in an ontology we give additional context and knowledge about this specific event in our graph. And now we can ask questions saying, what were the impacts of Katrina when it made landfall in a specific uh, spatial area? Now, of course, hurricane can mean different things in different uh, ontologies. And one way of us adopting a uh, giving better sense to it is uh, adopting standard specifications to model semantics. And uh, again, this is what makes of uh, uh, ontology, uh, makes our nowhere graph fair in a sense also, I would say. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my perspective on the importance of ontologies. They help connect the dots in data. Super, anybody wants to jump in? Yeah, I, I like thinking about ontologies as a way um, for scalable data management. And one example that I'll give is, I believe it's DBpedia, where it's really easy to add new facts to the database, but it's really difficult to add new predicates. Um, and so in this sense, it provides a sort of guardrails for end users to input information. And this is also true with uh, Golden, the uh, distributed uh, kind of Wikipedia competitor, where they have uh, predefined um, guardrails for thousands of, of users to input information. And so I think it's, it's a really great tool for scalable data management, where you have non-expert users entering information, and you essentially use it as a way to tell them what's possible and how to model reality. And it's up to them to fill in the appropriate information. Just, just to, to, to add to that, Thomas, because, because that is, that is uh, such an important point, which I sometimes tend to forget. Uh, so, so essentially, essentially uh, uh, you were mentioning the, the, that ontologies also serve as, as essentially constraints on the data. 
right? And and I, this is this is extremely important. And and again, this this speaks to the kind of dual purpose they have. That on the one hand, they explain and they make the bridge to the human conceptualization. On the other hand, they constrain the data and inform as a schema the underlying graph, right? And and it's 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 the fact that they can be in this multi-purpose space, right? Which I think makes it so powerful. So this is cool. Okay, so one thing that I hear people often saying in this context, if you look at knowledge graph as web scale systems, and they're going to connect across many different data layers from science to, to, to journalists, from you know, world knowledge, so to speak, to the frontiers of science and so on. There will be also facts that maybe we, or I should maybe say statements and not facts that we disagree on, right? And that may be true for the, the individual statements, but maybe also true for what we called these ontologies, right? So we don't all share the same conceptualizations of what is around us. How would you how would you deal with this in such a web scale knowledge graph for the US? I, I think that's one of the big advantages, uh, Yano, is that it is a fact of life that people will have different notions about, you know, what we think are common concepts. Two, for instance, that come to mind for me is, for instance, something like carbon dioxide flux. So many of us would be familiar with carbon dioxide flux in the context of, of global climate change. And um, but there, when you talk to researchers, they have different ways of measuring carbon dioxide flux, which are actually not compatible, right? They would require a conversion. But you could even broaden this notion of carbon dioxide flux, which also from more of a chemical and physiological perspective, you're talking about, for instance, carbon dioxide flux in the human lung and, you know, which it determines how much CO2 is in your blood. So the the luckily our semantic approach can enable you to look for carbon dioxide flux and then see all of the various potential uh, definitions or perspectives on what might be meant by carbon dioxide flux and, and basically then interpret and find relevant additional materials, whether you're a chemist coming who's interested in carbon dioxide flux, a physiologist or a, a climate scientist. Another favorite example of mine is forest, which is really necessary to understand, you know, sort of um, actually climate change and and the rapid di disappearance of forests around the world and how the definitions of forest can change a lot depending on whether the, you're the United Nations FAO or the USGS or you know some some small county level uh, group you know in in the United States that's trying to preserve some of its its wildlands but all of those can be accommodated thanks to the various structures that afforded to us by, by RDF. And as well as using some of the formal formalities of things like SCOS, which gives you the opportunity to say this is related to, or this is narrower than, if not going you know, a formal you know, class, subclass, um, or alternate label uh, kind of a pro, all very, very standard ways to represent those relationships in uh, these W3C languages. It is one of the most fascinating things for me uh, when doing uh, ontology modeling with with interdisciplinary groups um, to to kind of get at, at the types of of differences, Mark, which you've just mentioned, which just go beyond beyond you know easy factual stuff, which of course can also be like if 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 two historians disagree on the birth year of Shaka Zulu, right? That, that that's easy to handle in a knowledge graph, right? But the conceptual stuff, which Mark mentioned, and and uh, kind of we, we we tend to say that. Um, you should have, uh, when you do ontology modeling, you should have at least two domain experts uh, in the group who do not always agree, right? And, and then the, one of the most fascinating things is making a model they can actually both agree on. And yes, it's possible, though it's not always easy. Uh, like for example, and, and then, then of course you get these notions where uh, but as Mark said, they may have different underlying definitions. There may be notions which are everyday notions but they actually can't really define what exactly it is, right? Like for example, working with ocean scientists, they were always talking about water columns. I, I, they weren't really, you know, it, it's it's not a clear notion, right? You, you, it's 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 really hard to model that, right? In a classical sense, 
um, but it's a central notion, right? For example, so and, and this is very fascinating. Uh, but but yes, needs some effort uh, on on the modeling side. Well, super, and that brings us to a very interesting uh, follow up question, namely how to scale this, right? Obviously, if we would have what you just described, Pascal, that we have the two right people in the room and they have their conflicts and their agreements and you see them converge, that would be wonderful. But maybe two is not the right number to represent a larger domain, maybe five, maybe 10. So uh, we have done these vocabulary camps all here together in the future. But the question is still, how would you scale this? And what is the role of, of novel techniques like, for instance, from machine learning or presentation learning that we could maybe add to what we are doing top down to scale the creation not only of assertion and knowledge but also of the schema knowledge so since since you mentioned me um i have a I have a complex answer to this <laughs> bear with me um so um there was an old school idea around that. And the old school idea is from, from the kind of beginning, beginning time of, of the Semeni web world. Um, and, and the old school idea was, uh, well, we, make, we just need to make ontologies everybody agrees on. Uh, there's a pre-semantic web uh, uh, school of thought, which, which essentially we know now doesn't work, which was we just make one knowledge base for everybody. We now know that doesn't work, right? But then uh, about 20 years ago, it was all by we need to make ontologies everybody can agree on and then use, right? And then you make this effort once and then it's done. And uh, in my opinion, that was it was good that we tried it out, right? But it, this hasn't really worked. It has worked for some areas for some specific corners, but in most cases it doesn't. And, and most ontologies which are out there modeled with this mindset essentially were one-shot ontologies. So they were made for one specific purpose, uh, which makes you wonder why you just didn't kind of use a database. Um, but okay, we, we were, we're wiser now. So, so these days kind of the, the mindset I, I believe needs to change and is changing. So one of them is you don't try to model it for everybody, you, you, you acknowledge that different use cases have different requirements on the graph schema, right, and in the graph shape. Uh, and while you're still trying to, to organize your, your data and your knowledge graph in a way that it uh, can be rather flexible uh, and cover more than one use case and se several use cases, it's, it's important to just consciously acknowledge that there is a certain limit to what you can do in that way, which essentially means you need to have some other ideas how to do the scaling. And the ideas kind of which I would put forward kind of in my mindset to this are on the one hand, make a schema that is easy to adopt but one where you know, yeah, you will have to adopt it, but it's easier to adopt. Make a graph that's easier to adopt than previously. And then more importantly also, um, uh, uh, don't think of ontologies as things that, uh, an ontology that everybody can do, but think of little central pieces of an ontology that can be much more widely scared. We call these modules. And uh, we, we make these modules often out of design patterns, which can be much more widely used. They are very small snippets, like how do, you, uh, how do you encode, say, the relationship between persons and their organizational affiliations? That would be a little pattern. Or how do you encode a sequence? So there's probably three or four ways you know, of, of doing that, which, which kind of makes sense. Call this a pattern, which you can easily reuse. So if I make an ontology, I need to encode a sequence. I have these patterns I can look up and say, well, this one works for us, right? Uh, and then it will often also work for others because it, they are carefully designed patterns and modules uh, which, which kind of work over a wider context. And you can just take those pieces without having to subscribe to the whole ontology, 80% of which may not really be that central and important for you. Yeah, absolutely agree. And uh, I think that that is spot on. Anybody wants to add something here? Yeah, I'd like I'd like to expand into the middle ground. I think that Pascal just said, you know, the global one one to rule them all didn't really work, and we got to go modular because. Uh, and I think that there's a middle ground, and perhaps best represented by the gene ontology, and Kebby, um, with just the chemical bio uh, ontology. 
which both of those I think are, are quite useful to a relatively focal domain. But were it not for those, I think there would be a lot more confusion, certainly relative to the gene ontology, you know, which nicely define, uh, forces you when, you when you're proclaiming you found a gene to talk about where it is and you know, what it does using a standard set of terms. And if what it does is not there, you have to formally apply for, you know, a new term to properly represent this new type of relationship you've found. So, uh, so I, I agree that the, the, the one ontology to rule them all is, you know, problematic. And, and the modularization, maybe modularization up at the level of some, you know, discipline that that has a need and has the expertise to do it properly as a, as ex, uh, exemplified by the gene ontology primarily and also the, the kebi ontology to some degree you could call us version three of the entire endeavor right first you know the classic semantic web then the linked data stuff and now the knowledge graph incarnation and of course this is how science and industry and knowledge progresses in general but it's important also to look back. So re reflecting back on version two or maybe even version one of, of you know, linked data and semantic web, what have we learned that this time we believe that's going to be a success now? Well, I think in, in the area of environmental data, and all of these environmental data repositories, as we mentioned earlier, that FAIR paper really galvanized people. For some reason, I mean, I think it's something all of us knew was important, but it just kind of put an acronym and defined different facets of the, of the challenge. And, um, you know, I, so I think that the awareness of the value of trying to make your data FAIR and then how do you do it, there were lots of hints in that paper about how to do it. And uh, you know we're the we're the ones I think that are very much pursuing exactly down those lines. So I think it was just the the broader awareness and pro proclamation. You see this at the research data, you know, the International Research Data Alliance, for instance. They're very concerned about fair, and they've got several working groups that are focused on semantics. So it's the same thing at ESIP, where there's been you know a burgeoning of groups focused on on semantic approaches, and so. So I think that just the uh, you know finally it's it's dawning on people they're they're getting understanding about how graph technologies work about the importance of the W3C recommendations took a took a long time but I think it's finally happening. Yeah, there, there's there's a couple of I mean it's a very multifaceted question, right? I mean uh, we, we we've learned a lot. We've also learned a lot what not to do. Uh, over the last 20 years, so that's important. Kind of mentioned some some of those earlier already, uh, but I think there is there is another substantial difference between the knowledge graph uh, trend going on right now and and the the linked data trend which we had 10 years ago and uh, or or 12, and the ontologies trend right which was 20 years ago, and and I think one difference is that uh, while while there was always a lot of in industry interest, right? There has always been a lot of industry interest. This time, uh, what industry is doing is production level. And that really makes a difference. Um, and and that's, that, that probably means that the, the Gartner projections from 20 years ago about so many web technology will be mature in 20 years, you know, <laughs> we're probably not that far off. <laughs> Anybody yeah, Pas else? Pascal, what you probably know the history, but you know, I think when Google kind of said, "Oh, we have a knowledge graph," when they kind of, uh, you know, purchased uh, Freebase, which was an unfortunate name for, for us for a database, but um, that kind of also was was like, "Oh, Google has a knowledge graph." I it sort of introduced that term into the into the popular purview. I think, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So and, I mean, they were the leader, and then you know, a few years later, uh, there there was this paper which I always like to cite in in uh, ACM in communications of the ACM, which were several IT uh, multi globals, right, including including Google and and uh, 
uh, and eBay and, and Amazon and Microsoft uh, who, who talked uh, each in the same paper about their industry internal knowledge graph and their, their importance about it, right? Uh, so this is one thing. And, and of course, you know, um, they wouldn't expect that it invested a lot of money if, if there weren't the, the outflow at the end, yeah, in terms of added value. But also, for example, the fact that um, uh, Amazon, Amazon Web Services, uh, now with, with the Neptune triple store, right? I mean, there have been triple stores around for, for whatever, how many years you want to think, um, but, but they were always by small companies. Uh, by spin-offs and so on, and that was that was fantastic, of course, right? But but now seeing a major player who really kind of gets on the field uh, and is doing a lot uh, there, th that's also a changer, right? That that changes significantly, and then you have other other companies like like Tiger Graph, for example, which is also pretty substantial size already as a as a as a startup. Um, so this really changes things. I think there is still a lot that could be done in terms of tool improvement. Uh, but I'm very optimistic now that this will come. Yeah. Well, you're making a very interesting parallel also to, for instance, what's going on currently in this metaverse thing, right? Where suddenly, you know, Facebook rebranded to meta and are picking up something as a new idea, which has been around for, you know, 20 years and also with various startups. And now suddenly it's gaining steam. So sometimes a very big flagship, of course, helps clear the, you know, the storm, so to speak. So I agree, that's a good observation. So we were we are obviously very optimistic in, in, in most parts of the session and we are we only have three minutes left. So let me let me ask a um, more gloomy question, so to speak. What are the biggest challenges on the horizon? I hope to hear because this is our last question from each of you. What are the biggest challenges on the horizon for developing this proto open knowledge network uh, as a you know web scale decentralized network for the United States? I'll go real quick. I think that for me, it, it's it's twofold. It's the um, the scalability, um, which is going to lead to challenges in in query resolution, and it's building effective user interfaces uh, to enable you know the common person out there and not just the experts to effectively access the the graph. I think that consensus will be a really big problem. Um, it's already a, a problem in so many places. And the knowledge graph community, you know, I think is fragmented on different levels. Uh, on one hand, uh, there are so many different products out there. We could all name a dozen recent startups. Uh, we could name half a dozen different query languages. And even the technology itself is fragmented between LPGs and, and triple stores. And how does all of this come together? And I think we're at least seeing improvements. We're seeing kind of abstraction layers emerge on top like Gremlin. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think as time goes on, um, kind of the victors will emerge and we'll probably you know, have more of these abstract layers on top, uh, which should hopefully really help. I think based on our experience with uh, Nowhere Graph, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that I see is maintenance uh, because knowledge graph construction is not a one-time effort. Uh, it, it It's a life cycle that you have to constantly, uh, that you need to constantly make sure that the data is updated, that the data is clean. Sometimes semantics may change. And so, uh, one, the concern that I see with not uh, constructing a big knowledge graph is the cost associated uh, with maintenance and also the fact that there are no really good tools out there that can be used for, you know, constant update, continuous update. Um, that's tra data translation. Good point. All very, very good points, I think. So any, any, any closing remarks? Obviously, we only made it through half of the questions that I prepared. And I think we could have, you know, easily made this a 90 minute session. And to a certain degree, I think, you know, once, once we can all meet in person again, having this in an in-person setting as maybe even a recorded event like the one here, talking a little bit about the philosophy of knowledge graphs would be really, really great. So 
Any 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 famous last words before we stop the recording? I, I was I was betting on you, Pascal. But then, thank you so much, everybody, for for uh, listening, and um, for all of you in the future who are going to also look at these recordings. Thank you so much for NSF and others for organizing these expos. And bye bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.